All right, good to see everybody. Thanks for being back. Thanks for missing last week when I wasn't here. Uh, so it's good to be back with you and to uh, have this conversation. This is probably our second to last one. Probably do one more though. I think the next one, I don't expect it to be quite as long as these, but there's a good bit to cover today. Today we're gonna be looking at a little more scripture, but uh, a large part of it is gonna be sort of uh, have, having an understanding of human sexuality in our modern age and looking at sort of a traditional perspective and a progressive, more progressive perspective. So that's what we'll be doing. Any questions from last time that y'all kind of thought of or popped up before we get started? Okay, good. Let's uh, pray together then. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and love. Um, Lord, you do love us deeply. Uh, you have made us for yourself. Uh, you invite us into a, a relationship with you. And, you offer that relationship uh, to just the whole human race. And we want people to encounter uh, your forgiveness, your grace, your freedom in Jesus Christ, uh, your uh, glory and holiness. And so we just pray that your Holy Spirit will help us in our conversation today. Help us as we wrestle with uh, an issue that has become uh, kind of at the forefront of our culture today. And uh, Lord, uh, just what you want us to uh, live out and say and do as a result. And uh, Lord, we're seeking your guidance and discernment uh, for, as a church with this as well. And we pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The, the end of last time, uh, one of the last things I mentioned is how uh, the Holy Spirit takes us through church epics and in those epics a lot of times will the, the Holy Spirit will kind of get the church to dig deeper in particular issues than in the past uh, and so the issue might be Jesus's identity it might be the Trinity it might be the scripture it might be slavery it might be uh, you know should should women have a role in in uh, ministry and preaching you know uh, but but through each age uh, the Holy Spirit kind of takes us through these areas. And so one of the cases that uh, those that are more progressive with human sexuality will make is the case that if you look at things that we've gone through in the past, like slavery uh, or like women in ministry, though though today we, there are still differences between Southern Baptists and Pentecostals and Methodists in terms of what role women uh, can play in you know, uh, following, following the Lord's call in their lives. Um, but they look at these things and they say, if you look at these other issues and ha maybe divorce, or I know those that watched Alice Rogers and her talk at, at uh, McEacher and when she talked about Galileo and how Galileo's idea about the solar system and universe was revolutionary. And so, so we learn new things and we adjust to those things. And so, as I mentioned, uh, uh, kind of it seems like the issue of our day is human sexuality. And so with that, the progressive case is, is, is that sexuality is in a similar category to these other issues. And so as we wrestled with these other issues, uh, so, uh, so we can do the same thing and, and, and uh, find out how it'll fit in today's world. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of how these things are a bit similar, but also how they're not similar. Um, for instance, Adam Hamilton in his book, Making Sense of the Bible, uh, he quotes uh, the issue of slavery being one area where uh, scripture um, may have had some things that were relevant thousands of years ago when slavery was around. But is not relevant today. So like Exodus 21 verse 20, he quotes, when a slave owner strikes a male or female slave with a rod, the slave dies immediately. The owner shall be punished, but if the slave survives a day or two, then there is no punishment for the slave is the owner's property. And so, you know, he wrestles with 
how is this the word of God when as a church we've come to the conclusion that slavery is wrong? And he says, here's the point. There are things commanded in the Bible in the name of God that today we recognize is immoral and inconsistent with the heart of God. Rather than attempting to justify such things, we should loudly condemn these teachings and commands and make clear that this did not ever reflect the will of God. Okay, so that, that's his case. So what do we do with these things like slavery and, and other topics like that? First, uh, with slavery, um, and then maybe I ought to say, in our understanding of Scripture, as fully God-breathed, as fully inspired by God, right, 100%, but, uh, but like, I think in a similar way that we understand Jesus, also a fully human book. So, for instance, in Exodus, uh, when Moses was writing the Ten Commandments in Exodus, he was living in a world where slavery was just everyday reality. And his vision was not at a place to, to do something totally different back then. And the Holy Spirit was interested in other issues besides that issue. And so as a result, uh, we see both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, say with slavery, that Scripture is having this debate about uh, <clears throat> the issue. And so you do get a text like in Exodus that he quotes where it seems like slavery is okay. But then the story before that, right, is the Israelites are all slaves. Is that a good thing? No. Uh, God wants to set his people free from their slavery. Uh, and so he uses Moses to bring people out of Egypt, out of their slavery, out of their bondage, and give them freedom. And this was a huge story, for instance, for the lives of slaves here in America. You know, a lot of the spirituals that were written by slaves focused on, well, God did it for Moses' people. You know, we're, we're trusting God's going to do it for us one day. Um, and so in the Old Testament, we see kind of this dual thing, a, a reality of understanding that slavery exists, but also an understanding, a hope that it wouldn't exist and that freedom is better than slavery. If we fast forward to Jesus, Jesus doesn't really choose to talk about this issue uh, really at all, I don't think. Again, but he used some parables about slaves. Servants, uh, he called them servants. Well, servants or slaves, yeah, sure. He called them servants. Sure, sure, that we we should see ourselves as servants of Absolutely. the living God. Good, sure. Good yeah, and, and Paul himself would have seen himself as a slave of Jesus or a slave of God. So that's a good point, June, for sure. Uh, but Paul does, um, does kind of dig into it more. Uh, we see it in Ephesians. The one part of Ephesians I really didn't get to preach on is the part about slavery, where uh, Paul calls slaves to, to serve in ways that please Jesus even more so than their master, but then calls on the, the masters uh, to treat their slaves with kindness and care because both the master and the slave are going to stand before God as the ultimate judge. And if you've treated your slaves bad, then, then you need to beware, right? And then the most interesting is the little uh, letter of Philemon. Uh, Philemon and Onesimus, and I can't remember which is which, but I, I think maybe Philemon might have been the slave and Onesimus the, the owner. Uh, but either way, um, in that story, the, the slave runs away from home, finds Paul in his community he's uh, ministering to, becomes a follower of Jesus, begins growing in his faith as a disciple of Jesus, and, but he's a runaway slave, and so Paul's got to figure out, how do I handle this? Um, you know, do I just send him back home? But the interesting thing is he knows that his owner is also a believer in Jesus. And so he writes the letter of Philemon saying, you know, uh, he's here with us. He's growing in his faith. He's not just your slave anymore. He's a brother in Christ. And so I hope that you might consider just, you know, he seems to be making an argument 
you know, free him and let him be your brother rather than a slave. And so um, in scripture, we do have a pretty consistent uh, ideal, I think, that, uh, that freedom is what the Lord Jesus wants, freedom is what God the Father wants, and that slavery is not what God wants. Uh, this is picked up as uh, you know, folks like Augustine and Ambrose. I was reading some of their comments on these scriptures, like in Paul's day. And so by 400 AD, they are already making the case that when we get to heaven, one thing that's not going with us is slavery, right? And so the early church fathers are already realizing in their interpretation of scripture that, that slavery is not what God wants. And, uh, and, and a slave to sin. <laughs> yes, yes. He does not want a slave to sin. No, no. But he also doesn't want physical slaves either. He doesn't want us to own other people. And, uh, and so by 400 AD, you already have two or three of our church fathers coming out and saying, you know, slavery's days are numbered. Uh, then when we get, of course, to the 1700s and 1800s in England with William Wilberforce and John Wesley, uh, they begin making a really strong case to end slavery. And then that also leaks over to America and the Civil War in the, in the 1850s. Uh, you know, and early on in that are still kind of debates. You know, the, the South would debate well, you know, the Bible says having slaves is okay, so it's okay, you know, and the other side would say, no, it's not okay, you know, and, and we've finally kind of come to the conclusion that slavery is not okay. Um, but what we see in the scripture is there's a, there's a conversation even in scripture about, uh, about what God wants in that. Uh, with women in ministry, we see a similar dialogue, okay? In the Old Testament, if you can think of women who were great leaders in the Old Testament, there's at least one you can name, but there's actually more. Who would be a great leader in the Old Testament that's a woman? Deborah. Ruth. Deborah. Yeah, Deborah. Deborah. Yeah, Ruth. Ruth. Uh, she never was really a leader, but no. but she ended up being a mom of kings. So she was kind of like David's grandmother, maybe. Uh. But but Deborah. In a day and an age where uh, God was looking for leaders and judges who could be raised up and led by a spirit and have the gift of wisdom to lead God's people uh, out of their own times of slavery, uh, Deborah was one of the brightest spots as a judge, as a military person. Uh, you know, in a sense, she was kind of like a, an assistant general. Uh, the other general said, I'm not going to go to war and De unless, Deborah, you go with me, right? And so Deborah is just this incredible light of, of someone called by God to lead, not, to lead her whole people, to lead the whole nation. Throughout the Old Testament, there are other examples. There are other prophetesses that will pop up in Kings and some of the other places. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and the... The people of Israel, you know, the leaders, the kings of Israel would go and look for these particular people that were known to be filled with the Spirit and guided as a prophetic voice for the culture and community. And so there are several others in the Old Testament that pop up as, as prophetic leaders of the people. When we get to the New Testament, we see similar dynamics. We see Mary and some of the other women being the first to see Jesus, right, after the resurrection. Uh, they're the first witnesses that Jesus is not dead, but that he rose from the dead. So God didn't make a mistake. Women are all through the Bible. You just got to get in there and read it. Yeah, you definitely. Just get in there and read it. And then if you want to write all these names down, go for it. But yeah. God doesn't make mistakes. No, no, he doesn't make mistakes. And so... Uh, as we see in the early church, as, uh, as people come to faith in Jesus, as women come to faith in Jesus, some of them take on leadership roles. Uh, like I think uh, Phoebe maybe uh, you know, had, had a church that was at her house or on her property. Uh, we see the couple Priscilla and Aquila. 
And Priscilla is the wife, I believe, and she's always mentioned first. And it's a ministry couple that, as a couple, they are, they are working uh, to share Jesus in the kingdom. And we see other women's names that Paul will mention that, that they're partners in ministry with me. Now, on the other hand, we see that, and, and kind of what the church has interpreted this as, is that there are the other examples where women shouldn't teach, they shouldn't, guide, you know, they shouldn't teach men, they should be quiet, they should learn from their husbands at home. And a lot of scholarship has come forward and said, well, these other instances were instances where the women were embracing their freedom and their gifts and the, and the opportunity that the faith offered for them to, to kind of talk about their faith in public. Uh, but a lot of them were not educated. And because they were not educated, uh, they would get things wrong and maybe teach things that they shouldn't be teaching. And so Paul is perhaps, you know, talking in these cases as a corrective to to, you know, make sure you, you know what you're talking about before you take on any of these kind of roles. And so again, with women and their call and, and, and all that, we see again, scripture wrestling with uh, both calling women to be active in sharing the gospel and discipling and all those things. And we also see this other note that says, uh, you know, not so sure. And so the, as the Methodist church, as we wrestle with those, you know, back in about 1950, the church came to the conclusion uh, when they heard women feeling called to full-time ministry and called to, to serve in full-time ministry, um, that, that the church began to recognize that, that God and the Holy Spirit was, was making that call. And so women have been allowed to, in the Methodist church to, to do that kind of ministry. And John Wesley even allowed it to a certain degree in his day, right? He loved and respected his mother so much, and his mother got in trouble for leading a Bible study while her husband was away, and he came back and said, why are you leading this Bible study? And she said, well, I don't have to lead if you don't want me to, but, you know, but I think, I think God is doing good in this, and so, uh, you know, you need to take it up with him and, and uh, you know, make sure that... Uh, make sure that, that, you know, I really shouldn't do this. And, uh, and Samuel Wesley eventually said, I, okay, you keep doing what you're doing, you know, because, uh, you know. Smart man. Yes, exactly. So even in John Wesley's day, as, as he begins calling on lay preachers to lead societies and class meetings, um, sometimes along the way he would also find women who were gifted for ministry, and, and he would allow them roles as well in the early Methodist movement. Um, you know, as long as they showed themselves as called, gifted, and, and, and effective. And, uh, and so our Methodist heritage has kind of followed that, that course. So, so then the progressive argument would be is, is with sexuality, we're wrestling with similar things. Uh, that, uh, that it's another part that we're going through. But is it exactly the same? The traditionalist case would be no, it's not the same. And the, diff, the primary difference with sexuality versus these other things is uh, these other things we see scripture wrestling with, kind of saying one thing in one spot, but saying a different thing in another spot. And you've got to wrestle with, <clears throat> one of my professors used to say that you know, you want to look at the Old Testament and what is God doing there. You take a look at the New Testament and look at how things have changed through the age, but also how things have stayed the same through the age. And because we're trying to get a sense of what, what are the cultural differences and what are the moral standards that stay the same. Is it getting better? No. Yeah, no, <laughs> probably not. Um, but... But the difference with sexuality is that, one, we don't have a lot. The Bible doesn't talk a ton about it. And then, two, when it does talk about it, it is consistently negative, right? And we've seen how it's, it's negative in the Old Testament uh, in the Jewish culture. It's negative in the New Testament when Paul is ministering in the Jewish, not just the Jewish culture, but also the, the Greek and Roman culture that would have been very permissive with their uh, sexual ethics. 
So, so the traditionalist argument has been this is not quite the same as slavery and not quite the same as women in ministry because the Bible, uh, both 3,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago, has been consistent with this. And, and we could also say that the Christian ethic has been consistent with this by and large up until the last, you know, uh, 60, 70 years. And, uh, and so that's the case, you know, is it the same or is it different? And, uh, and so those are the issues that we kind of look at there. All right. So um, we'll look at a few more scriptures. Uh, and and uh, the first one that we'll look at, um, we'll look at Matthew uh, chapter 5. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I, I don't Yeah. So, is there a line anywhere? I guess what I'm getting at is sure. Miss Pentecost, who yeah. stand a, a drag queen who is mm -hmm. correct me if I think she she he whatever it is is approved to be. He's not a minister yet. No, so not kind of a long not time. Already. So, so I saw recently down in Florida. Right. He's standing up in the church. He's giving a children's sermon mm. to children. Yeah. Okay, so are there, I mean, it, it's hard to put, you can't put people in big groups. People that say yeah. they're progressive, some believe something, some believe, it's a continuum. Yeah. But drag queens in church, do, do they, do some of them say, this is not right. This is confusing to children. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, Adam Hamilton has talked about Mr. Pentecost or Mrs. Pentecost or whatever. And Adam has said that it's kind of made the insight, you know, if he was coming before my board of ordained ministry, I, I don't think I would accept him, right? Based on what he knew. Um, so yes, uh, and let's, uh, we'll try to dig more into this okay. and I'll come, maybe come back to that. But yeah, I know, I know that's one of the big ones. And, uh, you know, I know Adam Hamilton's response as, as more of a centrist, he would say, you know, this person uh, needs continued help to grow as a disciple of Jesus because, uh, you know, I'm not sure he's at a place where he is, he is, he knows how to do healthy ministry. Uh, but there are others that, that would say, Maybe we're doing ministry to this kind of community. And so, uh, you know, how Paul says, I would become all things to all people that by all possible means I might save some. And I think the real liberal or real progressive argument is, is we're trying to reach this unreached community. And so these sorts of things can be bridges for us to share Jesus with them. That's a bunch of junk. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bunch of lies. Right. Straight out of hell. Right. Yeah. I'm just I'm just telling you that I that know, would be their I case. Understand completely. Yeah. yeah. So so yes. Um and I think again that to me the question the question from our uh from our articles of faith is is the moral implications, right? And that's where we're going next. Is we have to wrestle with what's moral and what's what's okay. And, and John Wesley gave us a real helpful tool there when he gave us the general rules as to discerning morality. And, you know, Wesley said, if it's doing good, you're okay. If you're doing no harm, you're okay. If you're staying close to Jesus, you're okay, right? So, you know, Wesley, part of Wesley's genius was kind of giving us this tool to ask moral questions in terms of our lives in our community, and that's that's sort of where we're headed next, anyway. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Chris, yeah. the assumption about the difference in the situations 
it was always about individuals, slavery is individuals, mm -hmm. uh, women as individuals. But this is two people mm -hmm. that are intimate. Yeah. So it's different in a way because you're talking about a, a different mm -hmm. situation. A different dynamic. Yeah, as as couples, sure. And it's and it's from beginning to end in the Bible with the directions toward husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And it's Adam is. I've heard him. I was there that night when he exposed his beliefs on all this stuff. Yeah. You can love people, mm -hmm. but you don't need to agree with their wrong habits or their wrong lifestyle. Sure. Sure. And we're not. It's not making it more beautiful or more wonderful. We are going. We are going down a hill very fast. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. And I say we're getting there. We're getting to that point. Y'all, y'all are kind of getting just a little bit ahead of me. So, <laughs> so yeah. All right. Uh, so again, uh, you know, what what might Jesus say about some of these things? And, and I always think of the Sermon on the Mount as as part of his his answer. If someone like would like to read. Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, starting in the 17th verse um, through the 20th verse. Anybody want to tackle that one? Through the 20th verse? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. <clears throat> Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will dis disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys the God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Yep. So here we see Jesus talks about his relationship to the Old Testament right, to the Law and the Prophets, and says, listen, I've come to fulfill it, not to get rid of it, you know, I'm, I'm not here to change anything about it, but to call us instead to, to a righteousness that, that goes beyond the religious leaders of the day, you know, and these would be religious leaders who some of them would end up killing him. And then if we look at actually how he teaches, right, he'll, like in the next verses, he says, you have heard it said about uh, murder, but I say to you, don't even get angry and don't act out in anger. You've heard it said, you know, don't commit adultery. But I'm telling you, don't even look lustfully at another person. Right. And so here with the, he takes the Old Testament Ten Commandments and uh, does he kind of raise them to a higher level or lower them to a lower level? Yeah, he raises them to a, he raises them from disobedient action to uh, to trying to wrestle with the state of our hearts and trying to get our heart right in terms of how we handle not just murder but anger how we handle uh, you know sexual brokenness not just adultery and so and so you know the traditional argument would be here Jesus is calling us to to a high ethic as a in high virtue as a moral people. And so, you know, we should be careful about looking at the Old Testament and lowering the ethical standards there, right? Uh, but instead, how do, how do we help take those and, and raise them up to heart level? So, so that's one piece. And then the last, last primary scripture we'll look at is uh, Acts chapter 11. Uh, actually, 10 and 11. Uh, this is the story in, in Acts chapter 10 where God reveals himself to Cornelius, who is a Gentile in Caesarea, and says, you know, go to the next town over. There's this guy named Simon Peter there. Go get him, bring him. 
she's going to tell you how to follow my way better than you know how to at present. While he's doing this, Peter is uh, in Joppa in the up, upper room. He hadn't eaten lunch yet. He's uh, in prayer, and as he's in prayer, he has this vision. In the vision, there's the sheet. In the sheet, there are animals, and uh, when like all kinds of animals. And the Lord says to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. I'm not going to start today. But three times this vision comes, get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, I'm not going to. And then finally, the Lord says, do not call anything unclean that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure or unclean that God has made clean. Right after this, Cornelius's buddies get to the house and uh, Peter meets them there and they say, you know, our master who's a centurion in the Roman military. So not only is this guy a Gentile, but he's a military person. Uh, and though Peter has had some interaction with uh, centurions in Jesus's time, uh, he goes to Cornelius's house, begins preaching the good news of Jesus. And before he can even get done with his message, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes. It comes in such an obvious way that the people are praising God, they're speaking in tongues. It's evident that God has anointed Cornelius' family with the Holy Spirit. And that shocks Peter. It shocks the other people who are with him. Uh, but he concludes, well, if the Holy Spirit has, if God has said yes to this family through the power of the Holy Spirit, how can we say no? We need to baptize them. So he baptizes them, right? And then we get to the 11th chapter, and if someone would eat, uh, read the 11th chapter, uh, probably through um, verse 18, 1 through 18 of Acts chapter 11, which Peter kind of retells the story to people in Jerusalem. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, certainly not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the men's house. He told us how he had been seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Yeah, three more verses. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objection to praise God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Okay. All right, so this is one of the huge moments of the early church that kind of takes the church in a whole different direction. And, uh, and so it's a moment where, uh, I mean, as far as the Jewish folks were concerned, they didn't think there was any hope for the Gentiles. I mean, that was reality. 
We're God's people. God loves us. He's given his kingdom to us. He gave Jesus to us. It's all about us, right? And, uh, and so it's a huge surprise that uh, Cornelius calls for Peter to come to his house. And so Peter, going against Jewish ritual law, goes into Peter's house all because he had this vision. You know, he may have not been in a Gentile house in his whole life, but he goes through those doors because the Lord Jesus said, I've called you to go through those doors. He preaches, and in the middle of his message, as I said, uh, these, this family is baptized with the Holy Spirit, and because of the evidence of the Holy Spirit in their heart and life, uh, the, the rest of the believers in Jerusalem and everywhere else, the Jewish people, are must come to the conclusion that these people are my brothers and sisters. And so what I have called impure, I can no longer call impure because God has said they are clean. Um, in the recent years, this has been kind of one of the most powerful passages as I wrestle with the topic of sexuality. Um, it goes back to being at Asbury Seminary, a traditional seminary. But even there, I would have uh, professors who were in relationships with those who were wrestling with their sexual identity. One professor knew a fella and, uh, and, and had been a a friendship with him and got to know him and uh, just uh, reminded us as pastors be compassionate with these folks you know um, there was a second guy whose name is Bob Tuttle Bob uh, grew up in more of the Pentecostal Methodist environment uh, he uh, was he, he was on staff at Oral Roberts University He's kind of Asbury's, one of their main evangelism professors, though I'm sure he's retired now. But, but we're talking Oral Rock, he was buddies with Oral Roberts. Uh, he's an evangelist, sharing Jesus, uh, you know, Wesleyan heritage, came to Asbury to teach evangelism. And he was sharing with us, you know, in 1998 or 1999, a story he said, I thought that I was nearing Christian perfection. You know, I thought that my love for God, my love for others was, was where God wanted it to be until one day I got invited to go over to a house of two men. And I went into the house and began getting to know these two men. And it was evident that their faith in Jesus was real, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and that God was at work in their hearts and lives in traditional Christian discipleship ways and I had to wrestle with my understanding of things in meeting these guys who who showed me something different than I ever thought to see and so now as someone who is growing in perfect love I've got to figure out how to integrate this new experience I've had with people who are filled with the Holy Spirit but who are also practically married so he that was again 1999 i'm hearing these stories and uh and so as i've gone along and as you serve in churches you know you you have people in your church that uh identify in either whether it's known or not known more in that lgbtq kind of lifestyle or that that uh, orientation and um, it, one of the recent churches that I was a part of, I would say one of the top 20 disciples of Jesus in our church is a lady who's in her 80s, uh, who for a season um, had a partner. Uh, her partner died and actually did her funeral. And, uh, and she loves Jesus, she loves scripture, as I said, she is probably one of the top 20 leaders in that church. And what I mean by that is top 20 in spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. Had a heart for missions, had a heart for God, had a heart for Jesus. You know, we'd have conversations. You say, Chris, you know, I was married to a man at one point. 
All I can tell you is it just didn't work. Uh, but then I found this other person and, and it was right. But now that this other person is gone, you know, I'm not planning to get married again. And, and she was the kind of person that kept her relationships low key. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my experience of that is that, you know, they were just friends, you know. Um, but from those kind of experiences, I have to wrestle with the reality. This is what the scripture is saying. When you see the Holy Spirit at work in a person's life, God has said, they are your brother, they are your sister. And what I have said is clean, you can't say they're unclean. Um, now, I don't think it's a matter of judging yeah. another's situation. Sure. I think it's coming to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. There is nothing from beginning to end that doesn't mm -hmm. include homosexuality as a wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I can love a person and I sure. can love other people just like you did. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, but it doesn't make it right. It's not for my judgment. Sure. It's God's judgment. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I don't. You know, I and can the, love them and mm -hmm. I can treat them decently. I can do all this, but it doesn't change what God says about it. The parts sure. don't fit. You know, sure. No. That's just basic without a Bible. The parts don't fit. Right. Okay, you don't know anything. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and that, that's the, the good traditional counter argument. And, and so then we wrestle with uh, the issue of, so, so, you know, now we're at a place where churches, if, if we see people that are filled with the Holy Spirit growing in discipleship, we would, we would baptize them, we would say they're members. But yes, we are wrestling then with that level of leadership based on the scripture. You know, are we going to bless same-sex marriage? And are we going to ordain people in in that to that level of leadership in the church? And that that's where we're wrestling, you know. And I think mm -hmm. the global Methodist church folks are at a place where, by and large, they would let churches and pastors say yes to membership. But it is this upper level, uh, you know, that the Bible never says that we can bless this, and that uh, that is, you know. Uh, should they be empowered to uh, to feel called and to live out that call in ministry? This know? is a witness. Yeah. This is a witness that we are supposed to witness. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, we all have either, you know, family or have mm -hmm. neighbors and, and all of these situations. And just like in this culture today, that even if two people just because of economics live together, right. they're not gay. Yeah. There it's it's a it's a good fine. friendship. Yeah. You know? But sometimes when the when the sexual part comes into it, that's where the Yes. Where it, where we have problems. Yes. And just like your lady that is was all, you know, has done so much, but yet she's come to the point where even though her partner died, she's not remarried. Yeah. You know, that this is not going to be my lifestyle forever. Right. And sometimes I think we have to be patient that these people are coming to Christ and mm -hmm. becoming more and more mature. And I think so many times when you read some of this um, witness to yeah. that video, they break it off. Right, right. They, they say, I realize that God does not approve of this. Yeah. And they... And I know it takes discipline for them, but when they have God's discipline, they do it. Sure. But to accept it. Yeah, oh, yeah. and we're, we're, we're still moving in that direction, too. Yeah. Sex is not mandatory. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yes, no debate there. And, and as I said, I, I think uh, these days, you know, um, our culture as a whole pushes people down an avenue of being sexually active, right? Whether it's heterosexual or other sexual, right. our culture is, pushes that, 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 you know, go out and hook up and all that. Yeah, one night stand. Right, and so the Christian ethic for everybody, right, is it's still helpful to know that, that, the world is telling you this, but the church and Jesus say, you know, faithfulness in marriage, celibacy and singleness, 
And you know, that third category maybe you know be close friends with somebody, but you don't have to. It doesn't have to be sexual. You know that. You know, so there are kind of three other options besides sort of the sexual path. And, uh, and so, yes, I think that's it. I don't understand adultery is good either. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. So when you're talking about sex, no. it does do the whole thing. Yes, exactly. exactly. I, I went and saw the bishop last night. And she was up in Watkinsville, and that was a large part of her case. And, of course, she's more of a moderate progressive. But, you know, her case is there's a lot of sexual sin out there. There's a lot of brokenness out there. There's a lot. There's a lot of sin out there, right. and, and it's not fair for us to pick on a particular one. And, and that uh, I'll mention one more scripture. We won't dig into it much, but it, going back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, there's there is the scripture of you know, don't judge. You know the don't judge scripture. You know if you got a log in your eye and there's a toothpick in somebody else's eye, you know you shouldn't be worried about their toothpick. You should be focused on your own log. And and I think the. To me, the principle I've always gotten out of that, I mean, you know, yes, we're always making judgments about what's moral, what's good, what's bad, what's right and wrong. But, and we're all broken, right? We're, some of us, our brokenness is our temper, and other people, our brokenness is addiction, and another may be shopping and spending all our money. And, you know, there are all sorts of brokenness, uh, whether it's sexual or otherwise. And each of us kind of knows where we need great grace because of our brokenness, right? And so I think Jesus' advice is, if you know, if you know the things that trip you up, then, then you worry about that stuff. You know, don't worry as much about other people and their stuff, you know? And I, to me, that's, that's kind of a, a helpful lesson and that, uh, It's, it's you know. destroying something like the family unit, though. How can you stand back and say, just go ahead and have an affair with some other woman or some right. other man or whatever. Sure. You know what you are and blah, sure. blah, blah. Right. Right. Well, I, and again, in that case, I, you know, I said the bishop said last night, if we're looking at the destruction of the family unit, you know, a large part of that struggle is with heterosexual sexual sin, you know, and not necessarily, not necessarily same sex sexual sin. So, and I also would imagine with the church that yeah. if Tom and Joe want to have an anniversary or a, a, a special, a special time, either if they want to rent out the sanctuary or the fellowship hall mm -hmm. and have a party or have a, 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 a some yeah. kind of celebration. Yeah, that's against God. Right. So. Well, and the, that's also that's a church decision, right? It's that's not an annual conference decision. That's not a United Methodist Church decision. Well, you can uh, also that's have that's a, also a church. Uh, that's that's you guys' decision. <laughs> you can, everybody wants to bring their bottle. Go ahead. We'll just have one right down there. <laughs> we got big rooms. All right. With, let, so let's. Get, I'm going to try to pull all this together in terms of of, of an ethic. Um, and again, uh, June, Miss June, you've kind of helped us with sort of. When we read scripture and wrestle with sexual ethics uh, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, right? It's, it's uh, why did the ancient people say that this was not good? Uh, and we kind of talked this a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, that, that there's not that compatibility, that, that there's not fruitfulness in that relationship where it would produce children. Uh, and also being in an ancient tribe of people, right, that you want as a culture, as a community, as a village, as a nation, you want to pro you want to have as many healthy families and healthy children as possible because uh, those families and those children are going to be your warriors in the years to come and your farmers. And so if you're going to be a free community rather than an enslaved community, a lot of that's going to come down to making sure your community is as strong as it can be. And so uh, so marriage between a man and a woman is going to be the ideal thing to encourage. And, and Doesn't that weaken the community, though, when you have two gay men or two... two well, that's women. what I said. In the ancient world, yes, because it wouldn't... If, if nothing else, it wouldn't be fruitful, and it would encourage other parts of the community to not be fruitful either. So yes, yes it would. Well, That's what I'm saying. Into, you think about where we're headed with pedophilia. Yeah. I mean, 
the lines are coming down, the walls are coming down. And so. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think in all honesty, if you talk to most centrist or progressive kind of Christians, you know, they're they're still going to say that that whenever there's a power imbalance in a sexual relationship, that is sin and that is evil, right? So, so the idea of someone having a sexual relationship with a young child, a young person, um, even modern sexual ethics, no matter most that aren't, even the secular, I think, would say that that's, that's bad, right? Uh, you know, uh, I know Woody Allen, for instance, has kind of gotten in trouble with relationships with younger persons, you know. That's his steps, stepdaughter. Yeah, yeah, you know. And, and I don't think most people in America would look at those kind of things and say, that's okay. So, uh, but. Did you say that? Uh, Woody Allen. Woody Allen. Woody Allen. Okay. Woody, Woody Allen and his relationship with his stepdaughter or whatever. So, so yeah. But, but that my my point is, is sort of in the ancient worldview that was the mindset. Uh, when we get to Paul's day, we see the ancient Christian ethic have a uh, have a transformative effect on sort of the culture of the Roman Empire and the culture of Western Europe, right? Uh, so, in that day, in that age, they accepted the, the teaching of the Bible uh, traditionally as something that would transform their community. And, and so that's where we have kind of gotten that ethic that wasn't, uh, it wasn't a Roman ethic, it wasn't really a Greek ethic, but Christianity kind of did, did affect its culture back then in ways to, to move us in this direction. Um, but now when we get to recently to, to dig in to our understanding of sexuality, and of course I'm not, I'm sure there are lots of professors and people who would do this a whole lot better, but I'll give you my 10 cents. Um, about 40, 50 years ago, especially on the conservative side of things, when we talked about people uh, being in this LGBTQ kind of place, um, the thought was is that there must be something in uh, in nurture that was causing that. Uh, a lot of that would go to, for instance, uh, you know, maybe the child didn't have a good relationship with their father, whether it was a daughter or a son. You know, maybe there was a brokenness there, maybe there was anger there, but because there wasn't that good bonding between father and child, Perhaps that's what led people to, to become this way. I remember James Dobson would kind of talk in those types of terms back in the 90s when I would listen to Focus on the Family. Uh, and so that was kind of the traditional way to look at it. And so the response of the Christian community uh, was to try to do ministries that would bring people sort of out of that orientation and help them find, uh, you know, more heterosexual feelings and living and all that. Uh, which those kind of things have been come to known as conversion therapy, right? Taking people who are in one place and helping them transition to be uh, more normal like everybody else. Uh, one of the leading groups with this was Exodus International. Exodus International was founded by, uh, I think, a couple of guys that, uh, that lived, that had been in the gay lifestyle, came to faith in Jesus, uh, you know, ended that lifestyle, got married to ladies, and began a ministry to try to help other folks, uh, you know, wrestle with their sexual identity and, and kind of find transformation. And they did that for, I don't know, probably at least 15 years, I think, uh, maybe longer. Uh, it was probably one of the biggest ministries like that in the United States. And uh, eventually, though, in 2013, uh, the leaders shut it down. What was that one called? I'm sorry. Exodus yes. International. Exodus International. The leaders eventually in 2013 shut it down and it made headline news. And the reason they shut it down is they said, we've come to the conclusion that, that trying to change LGBTQIA people into heterosexual people, it's, it just doesn't, it's not really working. 
You know, it's it's not as helpful as we hoped it would be. It's not, you know, and so and so that admission, that honesty from this group, uh, I think, kind of help helped us realize that there is perhaps some type of also nature to this in at least five to seven, eight percent of the population. Uh, now, there's been no genetic markers that I know of that have been attached to, to sort of having a different sexual identity. They still don't know why, you know, 5% uh, of folks tend to be oriented differently. But it does seem pretty clear scientifically and from experience that there are just some people that, that you know, in their bodily wiring, they're, they're kind of different. I think culture a lot. Yeah, I was going to say, same culture. culture. Well, I, Acceptance. Well, well, we'll talk about that some too. But with the five percent, I don't know if it yeah. gets bigger than that five percent. Then yes. We're but the, celibate, though. Yeah, yeah, we're we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and so uh, again, and, and part of the differences between us, between those who are more traditional and those who are more progressive. Traditionalists, we look at all of human beings out of the Adam and Eve and out of the fall, right? We're all broken in some way, shape, or form. Every human being is broken. And so if, if you're born uh, having a susceptibility to alcoholism, that's a part of your brokenness. If you're, you know, if, if, you, if you have a bad temper, that could be part of your personality. If you, if you uh, have other, uh, you know, sexual struggles or other addictive struggles, that could be Part of your brokenness um, and so the traditionalists have tended to say you know sexuality for these folks it's just another kind of brokenness that that we all have to kind of figure out how to live through in our body and their brokenness is just a different kind of brokenness from maybe other people's brokenness but we're all broken whereas uh, more progressive people will say well if God has made these people this way then uh, then there must be a good reason for it, he, you know, and he must allow it for a reason, and, and it must not necessarily be bad. Instead, they should be able to kind of own who they are and, and see themselves as loved and blessed and all that, and, and be able to find their way uh, even in that lifestyle. And, and so those are kind of the two different pictures that that we look at things. One is the brokenness side, the other is, uh, you know, sort of, they are who they are. They need to be the best of who they can be. Um, and, you know, I, th I think I've got to acknowledge that a lot of, a lot of folks kind of, that, that come out of this place are often very creative. They're often very gifted musically or gifted mm -hmm. arts-wise or, you know, they, they've done some pretty pretty incredible and some of some folks in, the, in that area have even been pretty gifted leaders as I said there may be some evidence that some of the Caesars or Alexander the Great you know was had given a lot yes given a lot. so so there is some some good that comes out of all of us in our brokenness and uh, and so I think we have to acknowledge that too so um, so we have to then ask the question, right? Looking at the landscape today, uh, based also on the landscape of the past, in what ways, um, in what way, if, if the Bible does say, and since the Bible does say this behavior is not God's best, that it's sinful, then in modern culture, uh, where do we see where it's harmful? Where do we see that it's not good? Uh, where do we see that it, it separates from God? And, and so um, those are the kind of things that I, that I think y'all have kind of already talked about to a certain degree. Um, but the moral pieces there that, that I see uh, are a couple. Uh, one, one that I see and where we've come, all this kind of came out of the sexual revolution of the 60s. All right, so if you, if you were in, if you were part of that '60s group, then it, it falls, a bit it falls on that group, I guess, who kind of brought this wave of of new thinking about sexuality. But 
Um, in looking at some of this, I think a couple of things. Um, let me try to, first off, is that, uh, I think I mentioned this in a message a couple of weeks ago, that one thing I see as a negative, right, is that now middle schoolers and high schoolers, uh, not just some, not just five, 10 percent, but like more like 50, 60, 70 percent are wrestling with who I, who am I sexually, right? Uh, when most of us went through school, we just assumed, yeah, we're going to like somebody of the opposite sex. We want to date somebody of the opposite sex. That was the assumption of the culture, right? And now by middle school, our sixth and seventh graders are having to wrestle with, uh, you know, do I fit that or am I something else? And, and to be fair, in their minds, there is sort of this idea that, you know, uh, not that 95% of people are traditionally more hetero, heterosexually wired for the opposite sex, but, but they are, they're almost thinking that, you know, the, the other option is, you know, that there's a lot of, a lot of people and influence over there too. So, so that's one negative I think is, uh, is that our kids are wrestling with these sexuality issues at a younger age and in varied ways. Well, think, isn't it Piaget that said that it's like cutting the apron strings mm -hmm. at a certain point in this leaving home thing? This is part of that process too. Who are you as far as your sex goes? Mm -hmm. And that's a normal thing that teenagers go through. But now when you're thrown away everything, there's no help for them for mm -hmm. this. Right. Right. You know, sure. girls, you can have a telephone call if you want to. Mm -hmm. It's destroying things that would help them as they process from yeah. being a teenager to being an adult. Sure, sure. And I, I, I think, um, you know, where this is going, you know, where the UNC is going with this, um, is going along with the culture that's going along with uh, what's going on. It's very obvious in, in our mm -hmm. school. And, and I see kids who uh, wrestle with this, who think, um, I can be different. I want to mm -hmm. be different. I want to sure. stand out. And I may not be the best student or the best this or the best athlete, but I can make a difference uh, and be noticed Mm -hmm. If I'm this, yeah, this good. sexuality, this, maybe yeah. I'm really uh, born with girl parts, yeah. and I really want to be a guy. You know, but I hate to person. say it, though, so you haven't seen any folks who want that 15 minutes of fame, and they go into the school with a automatic machine gun and say, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -da. so, you yeah. know, yeah. that's, it, it's, it's that, I want to make a difference, but I want to be, re I want to be recognized, I want to be received as, uh, somebody that uh, they'll, when they hear my name, they'll know who I am. Sure. sure. Right, but what I'm talking about is just your average kids yeah. are, they now are being uh, put through this mm -hmm. thing, and if they decide to change their gender, my understanding, if they're 12 years or, old, mm -hmm. old, or older, the parent win. doesn't even have to say right. okay. Right. They can give them uh, drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are those are definitely issues that we'll continue to have to figure out as a nation. And the parents yeah. don't have a say. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, and sure. so I'm saying that this kind of thing leads to right. this. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No. That's that's sort of the second piece. I think where we do do see harm in the culture it is like y'all are saying uh, it moves from become people who are really wrestling with our identity to a broader culture that encourages uh, others to join our group to be like us in this identity uh, and uh, and so then you do get uh, then you do get people who maybe don't have a strong personal identity right yeah kind of, they have a weak view of who they are, 
And so they get in a group of friends who say, well, you're like us, right? And uh, so, yeah, we do see that some in, I'd say, women's uh, Division One sports in college. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of same-sex uh, mm -hmm. emphasis, uh, same-sex culture in those. The more athletic girls are feeling more like they, they have to date other girls. Um, and, and so there is a, there, there's definitely a culture piece too. Um, and so that's, that's also another thing that we're seeing for sure. Yeah. Back in the probably 70s or so, I had an uh, incident that just kind of opened my eyes. I worked in a doctor's office in Clemson, and this was in Midtown, and Midtown becomes very hippie. Right? Mm -hmm. And when I'd go to lunch, I'd see these young boys out of school standing on the corners as I walked to lunch. And I couldn't figure out why they were always not taking lunch with out yeah. in the street doing yeah. the better. And one of my co-workers says, oh, they're on drugs. Mm -hmm. And they're selling their bodies right. to finance the drugs. Sure. So drugs have had a lot of sure. Yeah, it doesn't help at all. And then they become trapped in the homosexual lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how sad. And this was back in the 70s. Sure, sure. That's true. Well, I think the age thing, and then we try to cure the age thing. Mm -hmm. Age is deadly. I have, I lost a, a young man, friend in my youth group, and uh, he got AIDS. He was mm -hmm. married and all this to a female and had, I think he had two children. Mm -hmm. And he got AIDS off at a gay bar. Mm -hmm. He got AIDS and he's been there for many, many years. Sure. Had this not happened, mm -hmm. he would be, he could be sitting here with us today. Sure, sure. Well, was, you know, and, and here in the US, we tend to think of AIDS as more of a, uh, you know, LGBT kind of disease. Whereas in Africa, it's just a, it's a sexual brokenness disease, yeah, right? Yeah, it's crossing over. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. It, it, it definitely has been something that that should make us think about how, how we view our bodies and how we, uh, how we handle ourselves as sexual human beings, for sure. Now, but I also, with talking about all these things, um, there is one piece that's probably been a good that's come out of some of this change. And that is uh, one of the largest group of young people that wrestles with suicide are those that are teenagers that have this different orientation or this different wiring or, or different feelings about who they are. Uh, you know, the, the rates of suicide in that group have always, have for a long time just kind of been, you know, way, uh, very, very high. And, and so I think the benefit is for the actual group that does wrestle with sexual identity in a genuine way, is that for them, they are at a place where they can, uh, they can own that better rather than seeing that maybe I just should kill myself. And so I, I think, I think that piece is is a good that's coming uh, because these young folks uh, now have more of a community or more of a place where they can they can begin to try to figure out how to how to live their life uh, with who they are. Um, that's a psychological issue from beginning to end with these young people that are at this point. I have yeah. a lot of folks. I have several folks that committed suicide in my family. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, there's issues there. There's a lot of things there. Sure, sure. But I, I, I think traditionally, having such a harsh cultural rejection, uh, you know, in our families or in our communities of these folks are bad, God doesn't love them, we're not gonna love them either. I think that, that heritage for teenagers you know, I mean, I can see how it would cause a lot of them to despair. Right? Well, our church has not done a good job of saying God loves you. Yeah. God loves you. He wants me to change some of these things sure. in my life. Sure, 
You know, what disturbs me is some of the times young people want somebody to talk to mm. and say, help me sort this out. Yeah. And then the government says, no, you can't have conversion therapy if somebody want, does, right. wants it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I, it's a matter of choice that if they desire that, I need to talk to somebody because I don't want to be in this lifestyle. I'd yeah. rather yeah. Uh, see what else I can do. And, yeah. and then yeah. as, a, as a government, we have, sure. as a people, we have failed to. Right. Well, and I, I think there definitely there are definitely still ministries. There are still definite roles for for helping people figure out how to be more healthy with who they are sexually and with their sexual identity. And I don't think it I don't think it has to be a lot of conversion therapy anymore. I think I think just helping people figure out from a if they're especially if they want to be followers of Jesus and they want to follow Jesus, helping them figure out. Uh, you know how they can do that in a way that uh, that works for them as human beings. As I said, I think you know the Bible gives us uh, you know, at least sort of you know marry someone of the opposite sex, stay single, and uh, you know maybe have a friend, but just a, a friendship, you know. And but for some, they're still going to choose kind of the more uh, you know uh, the more same sex. Peace. You can't even have a friend now. You can't move into an apartment with somebody mm. without it uh, making you look like you're a yeah. Bad. Yeah, I know. I know. For sure. Sad. For sure. So, um, so yeah, so all those things, uh, I think, <clears throat> are things that I see, you know. Um, and so I think as the church, we've got to continue to hold up sort of. God's best in what in loving ways and kind ways, um, in ways that that you know kind of what I would say to all of us as sexual human beings is you know what what is your heart identity going to be, and my encouragement for anybody would be let your heart identity be re your relationship with God and Jesus Christ, let that be first. Uh, you know, no matter kind of what your other feelings is or your other issues are, let that be first. Be grounded in your identity and your relationship with Jesus. And then from that, Jesus will help you figure out how to live in your body in a way that, that you can be at peace with uh, in, in whatever way that is. And then the second thing that, you know, I would tell folks is, is that, you know, we were made, we were made, for holiness, we were made to look like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to to uh, to grow to a sp place spiritually where uh, where we have that holiness of heart and life. And so, just to challenge all of us, no matter where we are, that that's that's what we're striving for. That's that's who we want to be as human beings. And uh, you know, all of us need God's grace because you know we always can grow in better ways. But those are messages that that you can give to anybody, even folks, and especially folks who are LGBTQIA, and say, okay, you know, maybe this is your wiring, maybe it's a little different, but but with prayer, with grace, uh, you know, let's pray about how Jesus wants you to live with this and through this, and uh, you know. And ultimately, they have to choose their path, right? They're free to choose their path, but but we want to be there just to support and encourage and love and, and all those things. So, so those those are I think some of the main things that uh, that we want to look at. So for me, as I said, it's kind of the traditional piece, uh, the traditional critique I think is that. You know, I think for 90% of children and youth, they're having to wrestle more with their sexuality than they did in the past. And for 90% of them, that's not a good thing. Maybe for that 5 or 7% that are, have some different kind of orientation, for them, it may, there may be some benefit to, to living as that kind of person today than if they'd lived you know, a long time ago. Um, I don't know if any of y'all 
There was this movie, The Imitation Game. Anybody seen that with uh, oh, the guy that played Sherlock? I can't think of his name right now. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Downey Jr. No, no not Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, Cumberbatch. Oh, Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Yeah, um, The Imitation Game. Uh, this guy basically saved the world in World War II by cracking the German code. But he was, he was same sex and identity and the government was trying to treat him and uh, he ended up either dying or committing suicide or you know after the war um, because it, in that stage in history you know after all he'd done to save the world uh, the government really didn't treat him very well they treated him as someone we need to we need to test and try to figure out how to fix him and, uh, and instead, he ended up dying at a young age. Um, you know, so, so in some sense, for some, for this group of folks living in today's age, it's there are going to be opportunities for it to be, in some sense, better for them to figure things out. But for us as a church, we want to be a witness of uh, of the idea that that there is a cultural peace there. Like some of you are saying, there is a rebellion piece. Some of our kids grow up and, you know, maybe mom and dad have been too strict. And so just to do something different and, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be this. Uh, either so that people will like me or that I can be my own person or, or that I can just be different from my parents because I think my parents have gone crazy. You know, whatever it is. You know, and that's always been around and there's always been ways to rebel. And so this is kind of just a new way to rebel in some sense. Um, you know, all those pieces, I think, I, th I think are concerning. I think, I think the secular ethic in the world that uh, is embracing more like polyamory and, you know, this idea, almost a, you know, a polygamous kind of lifestyle again. I, th I think there's a lot of stuff out there that, uh, uh, that our culture is going to have to kind of relearn. And I think, to be honest, I think this, we're in an age, this is going to swing. And right now it's swinging progressive. I think when that goes too far, I think our culture will begin to learn some lessons. They'll begin to wake up some and it'll come back, uh, back the other way. Um, just right now we all feel like we all feel how far things are swinging and it may take another 40 years for kind of the culture to wake up and say, you know what, some of the things that our forefathers in scripture and other places talked about, they, they actually had a reason for saying why some of these sexual boundaries were, were important. So. Does, does, does God give us, or does, does, does God give us latitude for that though? I mean, I, I don't understand. I don't right. Understand. You mean as a culture, as a nation? Not as a culture, as a nation, as an individual. Yeah. When I was growing up, I had two buddies that I loved deeply. Yeah. Good friends. Yeah. One decided to hang himself in the basement. Yeah. And the other one took off to California and started riding a motorcycle. Yeah. And he was our pianist for a while. Right. Right. And these were good guys. I mean, they, 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 they had their heads on straight, but they were bullied. Both of them were bullied. Big sure. Time. Now, one found that uh, it was way to get up there. Yeah. And we were all about the same age. Yeah. And that's when I found out there was ladies out there, too. Sure. And we were crazy for a while. <laughs> yeah. You know, but. Uh, I mean, I, I'd say, as I said, God's heart is that we would know him and love him and be saved by him. And God's heart is that we would, we would be holy in heart and life so that we're ready for heaven. You know, so that hopefully by the yeah. end of our life, we're, we're in some way, shape, or form ready for heaven. Did, did Christ say that? Did, did Christ say, as long as you keep my commandments and do and love, you'll be, you'll be living in paradise with me. Well, I mean, yes, he, he said God's grace is, is tremendous. You know, if God's grace works for a thief on a cross, it, it'll work for anybody. You know, um, you know, the thief on the cross didn't have a whole lot of time to be sanctified. Mm -hmm. uh, but but he, he was honest enough that he, he 
was saved and sanctified as much as he needed to be at that minute. Um, there's one heaven, but there's a lot of hell down here. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. I have a question. Sure. Do, do you think uh, that our bishop realizes the harm she has done? In what ways? In, in promoting uh, mm-hmm. this, in making this um, a part of uh, mm-hmm. causing mm-hmm. a split. Right. Um, well, I wouldn't blame our bishop for that. I, I think, I think there's a large part of the American church that that is kind of on a similar page to the bishop. Right, but but she uh, didn't have to go along with it. Yeah, no, she did. Uh, she made her own decision. Sure. To to be, and she had great uh, influence. Right. Well, as I said, I I was there when she talked about some of these things last night. Right. And what in her and part of her response, which I can't totally speak for her, maybe I'll make a copy of whatever she does the last one, but but her response would be, yes, in our culture, in our world, we need high sexual ethics. And she would say, it, and we need high ethics for pastors and all that sort of thing, because as bishop, she deals with the brokenness of the clergy all the time. And a lot of that brokenness, it could be an affair, it could be treating your staff meanly. You know, she rose up all these issues. So so understand our bishop is dealing with the ethics of folks like me and folks in the churches all the time. So, so she sees right and wrong and good and bad and all that. And so her case, I think, is um, that it's, she said last night, you know, being more progressive, it's more about the power differential that's bad. It's more about uh, the, uh, the sexual looseness and sleeping around that's bad. It's more the adultery that's bad. It's more the pornography that's bad. It, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Um, and, and so her, her point would be that, that two people who love each other and want to spend their lives together uh, is not her emphasis because that's more of a less bad than a lot of the other stuff that she has to deal with as bishop and less bad than a lot of stuff in our culture that we have to wrestle with. That would, that, that would be what she would say is something along those lines. Oh, okay. It, it's just um, because I, I guess uh, since my brother is, um, mm. is a homosexual, and I love my brother, and he has been accepted by my family ever since he came into my family as a yeah. seven-year-old when my mom married his dad. Yeah. Uh, but I, I see in, in his group, it's not mm. this individual loving this individual, and they happen to be the same gender. Yeah. It's anything goes. Yeah. But, and that's, that's where there's a difference, I think. I think. I think what the United Methodist Church is after is let's, let's live still by the biblical sexual ethics. But if you're the same gender and you find a partner for life, uh, that's definitely better than anything goes, right? So that's why I say, I'd say the bishop and most all of us as clergy in the United Methodist Church would still say anything goes sexually is a bad deal. It's sin, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So you can't drop, you can't say no more, you can't do this, you can't. Mm-hmm. The, the, in us, the Holy Spirit lives. Mm-hmm. And whatever I do that's not right, then I am convicted. And right. God doesn't let me get by. Yeah. Nor does he let anybody else get by. We can lie to ourselves. Sure. But we do not get by. Sure. The guilt is still there. The culture can say this is great. Yeah. Go kiss your neighbor's wife. But God says this is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So we have to go 
it, the Holy Spirit said. Right. It, well, and we have to trust the Holy Spirit to do its work in everybody's heart and life. You know, because because we can we can give a little nudge, but but we also have to trust the Holy Spirit. It, uh, to give you kind of the progressive side, this is this is uh, uh, what Adam. We'll wrap things up sort of with Adam Hamilton's perspective on some of this, uh, because Adam saw himself as a more traditional the theology early in his ministry, but over the years has has softened uh, to what we call a more moderate position. So this is what he shares. For years I felt compassion for gay, gay and lesbian people. I welcomed them into our church, but I told them that I believed it was not God's will that they share their lives with another person of the same gender because the Bible taught that same-sex intimacy was wrong. Now I did refrain from telling them that the Bible called them an abomination and commanded their death. But I told them that I understood that this prohibition was a hard saying but if they wanted to be deeply committed Christians, they needed to remain celibate. I was telling them in essence that they needed either to change or forgo romantic love and companionship for the rest of their lives. This bothered me in part because I was asking them to give up what was so life-giving to me. I've been married to Levon for 31 years, married right out of high school. Our relationship is not primarily about sex, but companionship. We are each other's helper and companion. I can't imagine life without being able to hold her hand and kiss her lips and sleep next to her in bed and share romantic moments. On the merit of a handful of verses of scripture whose historical background and alternative interpretations I had not fully explored, I was telling people who wanted to follow Christ that they needed to forego romantic companionship in order to faithfully follow Jesus. I was asking of them something I was not sure I could do myself, and which I was not required to do as a heterosexual Christian. As I listened to and read the stories of hundreds of gay and lesbian people, I came to love them, to feel compassion for them, to question whether these biblical passages actually reflected what God would say to his gay and lesbian children. But it was only as I began to recognize the complexity of scripture, its humanity, and he has various buckets for its passages, Fit, I was able to see that the prevailing position within much of Christianity may not, in fact, reflect God's will for homosexual people. So, um, so that that's kind of his wrestling and his perspective is that. And again, you know, it's it's about those committed relationships, um, and and so that's the progressive side, as I've mentioned, the traditional side. Uh, we would tend to encourage marrying the opposite sex, uh, staying single, which I think singleness in our day has become large part neglected. I think there is an avenue for people to feel good about being single. How, how does the Methodist Church right now feel about uh, uh, different, uh, not ethnicity, but different races? Getting married? Yeah. Yeah, today we'd be okay with it. There, in that's a whole other topic. Yeah. But in Scripture, the issue that I see in Scripture is is where faith is significantly different. It's not where race is significantly different. Now Moses married uh, his away yeah. from his tribe at all. I mean, he would yeah he married a, 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 a yeah a, a Midianite. A, a Midianite. Yeah, but. The Midianites might have still been distant cousins or something, but um, but yes, the, the interracial relationships. I I think if you read Scripture carefully, you can't you can't uh, you can't speak against that. Uh, whenever the Bible talks about it, it's differences in faith being the primary thing. That if someone is a Jewish person and another person is a pagan. That that's not a healthy, you know, that's not going to work because the pagan person is going to lead the Jewish person to not worship God anymore. You think uh, Adam Hamilton is uh, advocating sexual immorality? Um, I mean, where does he come uh, being different from the rest of us as we stand before God? I mean, do you advocate sexual immorality? Do you uphold? Uh, people in relationships that 
sexually immoral? I that, don't get it. Yeah, I mean, as I said, like like Adam would say, yes, sexual morality is tremendously important. Uh, and I think he would say one of the highest, one of the healthiest places to live out sexual morality is in a committed relationship with one person for the rest of your life. He said that's that's toward the being high single. end. Huh? Being no. single. Or being single. Other, yeah. Many people were yeah. single. Yeah. I'm yeah. always troubled when it says committed relationship when you're talking about homosexual couples. Mm -hmm. Because statistics have shown us that most of them is not a thing of love, but of lust. That they may have a commitment to one another, but yet they cheat on each other all the time. And so it, yeah. And and so I I put I understand some yeah. of them that may be committed. Yeah. Yeah. But the bulk of them are not. It's the most selfishness. Right, but we could say the same thing about heterosexual yeah, relationships, right? Too. So to me, that's that. See, the progressive person categorizes that differently. The issue is adultery. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. That's the sexual moral issue. It's adultery. Yeah, you know, you know, a committed relationship is a committed relationship, but adultery is adultery, right? And so they 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 wire their sexual ethic on a different framework that still says adultery or fornication or those things are wrong. And, and the higher goods are committed relationships for life or singleness. Okay, so that, that's, uh, you know, that, that would be sort of the progressive ethic is to shift it just that little bit, you know, um, for sure. But as I said, my conclusion would be that for all of us to try to find our primary identity in Jesus and call all people to holiness, you know, like Charlotte, you know, how can you help love your brother in a way that leads him to more holiness? You know, let him figure out what that holiness looks like, right? He's got to figure out what that looks like for him, but, but we can pray for people, we can show people that that we believe God's holiness is good for us and good for the community and good for society. And so how do you help them wrestle with holiness? One thing I wanted to ask, how come as, a, as Christians sometimes we are labeled as homophobic when really we have not been, when we have been open mm. to um, those that are uh, sure. um, in well, the gay community and that we have friends and relatives, but yet there are a part of the LBT group that starts pointing the finger and says, you're yeah. homophobic. Yeah. Well, it's all intimidated, that's all they want. Well, and it's, <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> you know, remember, that's something we have yeah. to overcome, isn't it? Well, well, remember at the beginning, I talked about the polarity principle, right? Uh, the polarity principle is the idea that, that you have kind of a more conservative side that wants everybody to, to be the same. Mm -hmm. You have the more freedom side that, that says, no, we each want to be our own individual. And the healthy place theologically and life-wise is to meet somewhere in that middle. And so the, the, the extremes want to point to the other side and say, see, they're all bad. Right? And so if we're traditional and we point to their side and say, see, they're all, you know, just, you know, free and all this behavior is just with everybody and it's bad and it's, you know, and then their side would say, yes, well, see, their side is just homophobic. You know, that's, that's the role of the extremes is they try to, they try to pit us against each other. And the role of us is to try to find that place where truth meets grace in the middle in a healthy way that works for us or works for our family or works for our situation. You know, I have a, one of my previous members, his son was in a same-sex relationship. And, uh, you know, they disagreed with it some, but eventually the dad and mom, he just said, he would quote Ephesians and say, you know, if Paul tells us in Ephesians that as a dad, I'm not supposed to try to, um, gosh, what's the phrase? Uh, 
to, I'm not, I'm not to make my children, I'm not to wear my children out, right? I'm not to kind of over-discipline them or, uh, you know, my role as a parent is to, to make sure that, that I maintain a, a loving relationship. And so with his child, he eventually got to a place where that's how he dealt with it, that his child has chosen this way of life. His child is going to an Episcopal church with his, you know, the, the person he's in a relationship with. They're, they're seeking to follow Jesus. And though they disagree about the lifestyle, because he's a loving parent, his choice was, I, my relationship with my child is more important than this issue. Yeah. Well, and it's the same thing with my brother. Our, we've yeah. always had a wonderful relationship. And yeah. he knows that, and I know it. And all of our other family members, that's not a problem in yeah. our family. Yeah. We love our brother. Yeah, for um, sure. For and sure. Um, so, but I cannot, um, I, I wish that he were not in the sure. lifestyle that he, he sure. is in. Right, right. Um, and has said, I, I feel for your experience there. You know, my only advice would be with him again is is make it all about Jesus and Jesus's love and Jesus's forgiveness and Jesus's grace, and not about this issue. Because right, right, talk about the right, issue. Because <laughs> if if he can get Jesus right, that lets the Holy Spirit, like Miss June's saying, help him figure out the other things down the road. Well, you know, you know we all stand before God for what we've done wrong. Yeah. But God has standards and yeah. truths. Yeah. And we need to find those and we need to try and you can't turn them around. Mm -hmm. They will stand. And the Lord is dealing with me. Mm -hmm. He deals with everyone yeah. personally. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. For sure. One scripture that came um, to mind today was uh, Matthew 10. Um, 32 mm -hmm. and 33 and everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven but everyone who denies me here on earth I will also deny before my father in heaven mm -hmm. so um, you know where are we as a church standing for the word of God right well, as I said, I, I think our church would say that um, there are people that have a big heart for the LGBTQIA community, and they would say they're doing their best to share Jesus with that community in a way that will help folks like your brother come to faith in Christ and grow in faith in Christ. And that, so they're, they would say they're still trying to share Jesus, right? Um, it just... To reach that community, they would say, we're doing things that make many of us uncomfortable because, uh, because they see those as bridges to connect with that unchurched community, where we see a lot of that stuff as being kind of outside our boundaries or outside God's boundaries. And that's where the wrestling is. Um, well, God is in all of us. The worst mm. is God sent us. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I feel we need to be welcoming, but I don't want to call him a pride fly right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think th the question is is sort of that boundary of orthodoxy, right? What you know, when do we begin doing things that that encourage unhealthy living, and when do we begin doing things that that encourage healthy living? You know, and it's we accept that's it. where that boundary. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We accept that that way it's encouraged. So, yeah. All right. We've gone over time today, but this this was uh, a big one. So next time, our last one, I don't think it'll be anywhere near as long, but next time we'll talk about sort of where the UMC is headed, where the Global Methodist Church is headed, and sort of how to, how to figure out where you might fit in that choice. So. Will you have them in hand now? Uh, I, I don't know. I'll see. If I find any that work, I'll do it. But I may, I may draw some things on the board. So. Uh, will you uh, ever have, um, you know, different beliefs or standards or doctrine or whatever and have UMC and GMC 
and how they look at that particular thing in a chart. I mean, and that's hard to do because right now our discipline is still pretty darn traditional. <laughs> so, well, we you know. have that, and we need to, uh, people need to make their mind up. And yeah. so this, this is a comparison. This tells you what this does and that does. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked about that. We really do need to, uh, there are a lot of people that is that, is are it? not aware of much of anything that's going on, but I do sure. think we need to show the comparison, and it is a true comparison of this is the UMC, this is the global, and so that people can really compare those. Sure. It's not only, as we've said over and over, it's not only the sex thing, mm -hmm. it is biblical things. I mean, it's sure. serious things in the Word of God. It's the relationship that they have with Jesus and what they believe about sure. this. And that's supposed to be changed in 2023? What? Is it supposed to have changes in the book in 2023? Yeah, I mean, the next journal conference. Mm -hmm. next journal conference. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we'll get into some of that sort of stuff um, as well, for sure. Um, but yeah, that, that's enough for today, I think. So good job. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you uh, just for our time together today. Um, we thank you that your goodness and love... Uh, uh, seeks to knock on the door of our hearts wherever we are. And Lord, as we open the door of our hearts to you, you seek uh, to grow us in grace. You seek to pour out your forgiveness. You give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. You call us to follow you. And uh, Lord, to seek your goodness and love and truth, uh, to live rightly with each other. And that's a journey. Uh, it's a journey that every human being is on in some way, shape, or form, and our prayer is that we might continue on that journey, that we might be helpful to others who are wrestling with the journey, uh, and that includes uh, folks who find themselves in more of the LGBTQIA kind of uh, orientation. Lord, you call us to love them, you desire to save them, uh, and you call us all to holiness and uh, help us live that out in our lives to the best of our ability, both for the blessing of our families and our community and our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, I think we're going to go to Bishop Sue. Yes.